Hey y'all, I'm back with more video card shenanigans. This one may take a while to get out because holidays and I mean part of it is frankly that as you can see I have that second RAM chip in now and uh, soldering that in was a job in and of itself. But it's in, it's in now. And uh, I thought I'd give a small demo. So I'm gonna pick up from exactly where we were last time. The only thing that has changed is that this chip is in there and you can see there are also a couple extra wires. Um, the way this is wired, and I'll try and get some B-roll of the backside of this thing in, but um, basically the data bus, well, both of the data buses are common between the two chips, um, as well uh, the address lines, uh, for each side are common. Um, most of the control signals also common. Really the only thing that isn't connected uh, and going to the same location on both chips um, are these, which are the chip select for the new chip, as well as that new chip's busy, uh, which I don't really plan on using for anything. So you can see I still have the LEDs for the main chip, well, the original chip's busy signal hooked up to LEDs, but I did not bother doing that for the other ones because, but they shouldn't be connected together, at least for our purposes and right now. And that chip select line is functionally going to act as an extra address line, right? There are 14 lines here, so if A0 through A13 gets shifted up by one and chip select becomes the A0 line, then basically all the odd addresses are on one chip, all the even addresses are on the other chip, and uh, you've made one big chip out of these two guys. So that's uh, what I've got going on here. Basically picking up from last time, uh, I have written into this guy the same thing that we had written in before, which was just that each nibble that was coming out of it, uh, or that I had written in from the CPU side, um, is just, you know, the bit position corresponding to that number nibble, right? So the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. Um, so as you can see, uh, if I just go through stuff on the MUX, okay, now you can see. So that's one, and I can iterate through these, two, three, and four, just like last time. As you can see um, in my with my little input LEDs over here, uh, that input pattern right now is different. And what I have written to this memory is the inverted values of what I wrote into here. So as you can see, it's off and then all on, and then on, off, all on, 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 off. So it's just the inversion. So if I deselect the original chip by pulling chip enable here back high, which is its disabled state, then I can show you what's in this guy by doing chip enable on that chip. And now if we go through, you see those inverted patterns. There's one, two, three, and four. So other chips in there, it's working good. Um, <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm not taking these things up to high speed yet, so I don't know how good good is because that can really change when you start getting up to speed. Um, but it's, it's basically there. So what are we going to do today? Um, well, there's this big blank space up here, and I think I could really stand to put a CPLD in there. I'm going to use, uh, as mentioned, another one of these Lattice CPLDs, really weird old stock parts that I've been enjoying playing with in such venues as obviously my uh, last computer project, as well as the video card for that guy. Been using those for glue logic a lot. So I'm gonna slap one of those in here. The way I've found works best for uh, working with the CPLDs in this configuration is instead of wiring them up and then doing the logic, uh, do the logic or at least a simulacrum of it that has the right inputs and outputs um, and then wire the chip in because if you let those pins be free, the CPLD can do a better job of routing the signals where they need to go for maximum flexibility. And then you can uh, start attaching wires to stuff. If you attach the wires first and then tell the CPLD that that's where the signals should go, um, it kind of can get over constrained and then you can't get the, the most out of all of the resources inside the CPLD. Again, in my experience. So that's my plan. Uh, I think I'll sh I'm first just gonna take the CPLD socket, just another one of these guys, and uh, just get it in the board, tack it in. 
and then I will show you my <laughs> super hacky uh, CPLD programming situation. Whip up some basic Able code. I'll show you what Able is too, because it's, it's weird. Um, and then once we have the IOs that are actually being assigned to the pins that CPLD wants locked down, we can actually start soldering those connections to all of these inputs we've got, you know, wired up here that we're currently using for test purposes uh, from the CPLD to actually drive this stuff. And maybe we can, you know, see it generating a, a test pattern out on the LEDs or some fun stuff. Don't know where we're gonna get today, but um, let's start playing around. Uh, I'm gonna get this tacked in and then let's go over to the computer and we will do some Able. Okay, so that's tacked in, um, and I can, you know, and I might as well, I can do the power lines because I already have references of those on cards that I've done previously, as you can see here. Uh, as you can also see here, it is, oh, that one is actually extra gnarly. Grabbed the wrong card. That was from my old IO card that I started building for the other computer. The CPLD is not so bad. Here's the old video card. Yeah, that's not so bad. So I will at least run the power lines because we know where those are going to be. Alrighty, I think, uh, based on these looking basically the same, <laughs> that this is all wired up for power. Um, and now all of these other pins currently don't mean anything. They're just undedicated IOs for the most part. So let's go dedicate something to those. Good old Windows 2000. So <laughs> I think most of this you're going to be learning as I learn because I haven't done this in a while. I do not particularly remember, and I know I had trouble remembering last time, uh, how the um, pin layout and assignment tools work. So we're gonna learn that together again. Lattice, ISP Lever Classic. I'm gonna pull up um, one of my old projects, which is the logic for the old video card. And that will show you, firstly, also how I set up these projects and remind me of how I set up these projects. Um, but, you know, it's basically your usual IDE setup, um, and this looks similar to, uh, you know, I haven't used another one of these in a while, um, but I have a Basis 2 FPGA board that I've played with a bit, and whatever, I think that's, I think it's Xilinx stuff on the Basis board. I think that's similar. Don't need automatic updates, I'm not connected to the internet. So you kind of have your source tree over here, which for this one, it'll probably be just about as simple as this. Um, so you have these ABLE files, and they are nested under the chip that you are deciding to use that you originally set up at the top of your project. And you can uh, also put simulation stuff in here and whatnot, but uh, I don't know how to use the simulation tools, so I don't. I just, you know, do it by the seat of my pants on the chip. But you'll see, so I have this wrap file. This is kind of my top-level definition file. And if I pull this up in this, you know, lovely, lovely editor that they provide here, 
At least it's got syntax highlighting, so that's good. Um, but in Able, you know, it looks a lot like a lot of other hardware description languages. You've kind of got an interface definition here. So these are all of the kind of the publicly visible pins of the design. Um, you know, you've got title, header information, stuff like that. And then you have the core functional block that starts describing the actual logic in here. Describes internal pins, which are kind of like variables. Enable this com designator uh, basically means it's a standard pin. Uh, there's a few different ones you can use, but basically you just want to use com and there's also uh, reg, R-E-G, and that is a, a registered pin. So basically that pin is corresponds to a flip-flop in the chip. And you can see in here, I've got a lot of the same uh, kinds of signals that I'm going to be using in my final design uh, for this video card. I've got a, you know, a data bus, address bus, uh, some clock signals, um, stuff for addressing the video RAM and such. And so as I said at the top, this is kind of a top level definition that among other things, it lets me hide internal wiring, which is good because once you've compiled this, all of these pins uh, even if they're only used internally and you don't actually need to expose any of those signals because they're just routing, you know, functions to other functions, um, they will appear in the routing. So you can just make life a lot easier on yourself and kind of make this wrapper put everything in one interface that only has the pins that you want to expose physically on the package. Then down here, we're just taking everything from video core, which is this core thing, um, and we're just attaching the signals that are exported from there and kind of re-exporting them in this module. So that's the wrapper. Let me refresh my own memory by digging into the video core. And you'll see, you know, mostly I want to replicate most of this because we're not changing too much. We're using the same video timings. As you can see, we have a similar export here describing the kind of module that is described in this file. And some notes to self that may be embarrassing. I have no idea. This code's really bad. You can see more and more of these COM pins for that data in bus and data out bus, all this kind of stuff. Um, you can also relabel things uh, like here. Um, DI is, you know, basically a, a description of the whole bus that is uh, DI seven down to zero. So it's just an eight bit wide bus described with one name. And like I said, you have some of these registered things. And that is mostly, so like you can see in this case, uh, this AC17 through AC0 is the address count register. And we'll see down below, this basically just counts and is always output on the VRAM address lines. Um, just like we'll do on ours, it'll be the left side address lines will be coming straight out of this chip and they'll be connected directly to a counter like this that has some logic attached to it, but for the most part, we'll just constantly count the address up at some you know division of the pixel clock rate. Oh, of course, as necessary, there's a column count register. We do want to know which column and row we're on for various reasons, mainly so that we can know when to output our vertical and horizontal sync signals, you know, because you want to output it at the end of one full row. So that's when the column count equals whatever the width of the video is. And of course, row count, uh, you're going to do a H sync when you hit the bottom of this, when you hit your bottommost row. And then with both of these also, that controls your blanking because obviously you don't want to count addresses when you're still clocking but not outputting any video because otherwise you're going to rip through pixels that are not going to be on screen. So I won't go through all this code, but it's really mostly pretty simple. In this design, uh, there was an 8-bit wide output bus going to the video output, and it was a 4-bit video card. So basically, as far as pixels were concerned, the pixel clock was uh, divided down by 2 for the address count. And then on every address, it would select the even side of the pixel or the byte, really. So the, the even pixel in the byte and then the odd pixel in the byte back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But in the case that the blank signal is active, so if we're in any blanking period, we don't select any video and it's all zeros out. So this is kind of our output multiplexer, except that we're doing ours in a separate piece of hardware on this new card. Here we've got the column and row count stuff, which is probably the functionally most important section. And really all this is doing is .clk is another one of those kind of special connections into this register pin set. And in this case, that uh, clock is just wired straight to the 25 megahertz VGA dot clock that is wired to one of the pins on the package. And then the column count just is itself plus one uh, unless it hits 
the very end of its counting, which is 799 in the case of the 640 by 480 timing that we're doing. It looks a little counterintuitive because I wrote it in kind of a, a very bare metal sort of way. But, you know, all it's saying is that if the column count hasn't hit 799 yet, then when it next clocks, it's going to equal itself plus one. But if it does, then it zeroes itself out again. Row count is pretty much the exact same thing. So it's tied to the same clock, but it only transitions if the column count rolls over. So this is just one of these nested inside of itself. Then finally, we have our sync generation. So as you can see, there's an H sync signal. And uh, this one's real easy. I mean, you just rip these numbers straight out of any VGA timing diagrams that you can find online. Um, but, you know, 96 dots are how long H-Sync is before, you know, it's that kind of that front porch period before you start displaying video. So all you need to know is, is H-Sync less than 96? Then we are blanking. And similar with the H-Blank. It's just every pixel below 144, which is why you have this 700 blah 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 number, is because there are more logical pixels on the screen than there are displayed pixels. You can equate a timing or a count or a width of these signals all in terms of how many pixels they are, even if you're not displaying a pixel. So basically pixels 0 through 144 are not visible and pixels 783 through 799 or 800, whatever it actually really should be, uh, are also not drawn, but they exist logically. And then the exact same thing with V-Sync and V-Blank. We don't draw anything if we are below the 35th line or above the 514th line. Anyhow, really the last thing of import in here is the address count. Because like I said, address count and row and column count are kind of disconnected from each other because the rows and columns, you know, those logical pixels, there are many more of those than there are actual functional pixels coming out of memory, displayed pixels. But that's basically it. The rest of this was kind of uh, glue logic stuff for, uh, you know, determining when the CPU was writing to us and some other things I was playing with to try and get video to work a little bit better with uh, interleaved CPU access that did not have the same timing as the video card, which is now, of course, ameliorated by the fact that we're using that dual port SRAM. And I will still probably want to do some of this eventually. Um, I'll probably want to at least define some pins for, you know, my, my bus and hope that things map good later when I decide to add some more pins or remove some other ones. One thing I do know that's going to make life a little bit easier is that it's a 32-bit bus and I will probably want to use all of it or at least have very limited mirroring across the uh, address space for this video area. But since this is a 64K area, I only will ever need to address with the upper 16 bytes of that bus because the lower 16 bytes will cover that entire video area of 64 kilobytes. Sure, you could arbitrarily shift things around in memory and then it would matter what the lower 16 bytes were, but why would you do that to yourself? But without further ado, I'm actually gonna open Notepad real quick and steal all this code for reference. Okay, now it's time to make a new project. For now, I guess I'll just call this dual port video. So I'm gonna go with schematic able, cause it's the only thing I can do. So this is your selection of what device you're actually using. And if you scroll through here, let me find my actual chip. What we're actually using is a ISP LSI 1032E 70LJ. Um, let's try and find that in this list, huh? ISP lever default device, ISP LSI 1K, 1032EA. Uh, that's not quite my chip. I don't, I don't know. 44PLC, 128PQFP. None of that seems right. Wait. How about we show obsolete devices? Now, mind you, this is a piece of software that I'm running on Windows 2000 that has no more support from Lattice. And there it is, <laughs> my ISP LSI 1032E. It was obsolete at the time this version of the software came out. So I'll start by building that wrapper. So I'll do new Able HDL module, dual port video wrapper. Time to steal some stuff from Notepad. So I'm really just gonna steal this whole freaking thing. What do we really need? Let's start with the address bus for the video side of the VRAM, which I'm going to call video address 13 through video address 0. Let's do video chip select. I guess I'll go with the data sheet. It's called chip enable. Chip enable. Video multiplex 
down to VM zero. The rest is mostly CPU side controls. Really all I need is to decide when to select the chip and if I'm reading or if I'm writing. I really haven't looked at the documentation for the uh, Motorola chip I'm using yet. I'm not sure how my bus is going to be set up for external devices. So I'm going to have to kind of guesstimate what signals I'm ingesting in order to control those things. But at the very least, I know that I will need what I will call bus chip enable, bus output enable, bus read write, busy in, and busy out for the input coming into the chip saying the memory is busy and the output going out to the bus. That'll probably change, much like my multiplexing scheme here is definitely going to change, but it's a good start. So now it's time to imagine some signals that we might have coming in from the CPU that will control the way that these signals ultimately get sent to the video RAM, enabling it and disabling it on the CPU side. For starters, we know we're definitely going to need the upper half of the 32-bit bus. So let's do a CPU address 31 through CPU address 16. I think there is a single read-write signal that comes out of the chip, and there might also be like a bus access signal, but either way I think I can kind of just fudge that for now. So let's do a CPU read-write and maybe a CPU access. Totally forgot to specify the dot clock coming in, that's going to be kind of critical. Another ABLE module, let's call it dual port video core. So let's start ripping stuff from the old code. Because again, I just need to fudge this together. So I think basically all we need to do is implement some of the counting hardware and then wire up like sane defaults for now for some of these other signals. Uh, you also kind of like you'd want to wire these signals to some of the output signals, maybe especially that don't matter in some kind of expression um, so that it, it doesn't abandon these inputs. But let's just work through some of these signals. I guess all I really need to do is make sure that I have equations in here before I start my equations. The way this works, I believe, it's probably obvious from the code we just looked at, um, but I believe these pins correspond exactly to the pins defined below. And just convert these into pin definitions. Oh my god, you can't shift tab in here. This is, this is barbaric. And some of these will probably want to redefine as registers. For example, we know the ultimate output address signal is going to be a registered counter. So let's change that to reg. And I think that may mostly be it. I think it's basically the video address and then, you know, again, those internal row and column counters that I'm going to implement in a second here. So for internal signals, I'm definitely going to want my row and column counters again. Let's just double check how many I had in the other code. Let's just steal it. Oh man, you know what signals we'll definitely need for video that are not being generated for our mucks? Horizontal sync, vertical sync, you know, your basics. So let me go through and add those back in everywhere. And then I'll add internal V blank and H blank, which is what made me think of V sync and H sync in the first place, and a global blank signal too. And then let me just go ahead and add a couple more of these you know, label simplifying things. Okay, and I just caught myself being a dingus again, which is not all that uncommon. CA is the address input of the upper half of the address bus into this chip. So this is common. 
and VA is our video addresses out to the video chips, out to the RAM chips. So this is a reg, not the other way around. This is kind of good, even if I wasn't making a video, it's kind of like, uh, you know, rubber duck programming. And, you know, except for some glaring issues that I'm sure may or may not be right here, I'm going to come back in just a second, even though it will be no time at all for you, uh, for my wife has made me pancakes. Okay, I'm back. I'm full of pancakes. In fact, it's a different day now. Um, so uh, the pancakes have come and gone. But let's get back to this. So we're going to need to implement some uh, kind of fakey core to this. One thing that I realized is later on, as I mentioned, one of the things that I'm going to want to do here is probably do a palletized output mode. I have to make some design, design decisions here because basically I need a way to address those registers that is separate from the video memory. The, the best compromise is probably going to be to pull in one more byte of the address bus coming from the CPU, and that'll take up a good chunk of memory. But, you know, 32 bits means that I can address four gigs of RAM, and I don't think this machine is ever going to or will need to have a full four gig of RAM installed. That will address my registers, which will just forward the bus onto my, uh, you know, DAC color registers that we're going to build. So let me make sure that change gets addressed everywhere. Okay, I think that's everything for pins and interface. So let's just make these pins do something. For starters, let's steal that column count and row count code from the old video card. In fact, I'm just going to steal most of this. So the H blank, most of the timing stuff. Uh, the video is going to be slightly different, but this stuff we can basically just rip off. The only thing we're referencing in here is column count and row count, which have the same names, and the clock 25M. And let's check because hsync, hblank, vsync, vblank, and blank should all be there. So blank, vblank, hblank, hsync, vsync. But address count, um, I don't think that's quite the same. What are we calling that up here? Video address. So let's make sure we replace those. Now the video address gets a little weird because this is where the real world actually starts bumping up against our design and our CPLD and the real world is slightly different from what the original video card was expecting. So firstly you can see our top end video address is 153599 which is uh, not right for our purposes. 65535. The other thing is we're gonna wanna make sure this only counts through those video addresses that uh, we are actually going to display. So this is where I have some thinking to do because we're eventually gonna change the output video format, but for now, I think I'm going to stick with uh, the four bit color with a slightly lower resolution. So let me do some quick maths. Um, I always get confused on this. It's two 16 byte wide, 16 kilo word chips. But that means the actual address is not going to be 65535. That is not where it's going to max out. The actual address maxes out at 16,384. That's the actual number. If I have 64K bytes of memory, but I have two pixels per byte, then that is actually going to be this number. That's the number of actual pixels I have to work with in memory if I'm using four bits for each pixel. A rather nice number in here is if we divide this by 512, we get 256. And that'll use up every single address evenly. I need to adjust this count down to the 16K number, but then we also need to do some thinking about how to prevent the video from displaying until we've hit the start of that area and after we've hit the end of that area. I'm going to call it V video area and H video area. But these will be really similar to the H blank and V blank. So we want to take the 640, subtract the 512 visible. That leaves us 128, so that's, that's 64 and 64. So we want to do 144 plus 64. So we're going to do 64 more rows, or actually more columns, uh, after the H blank area, 
we're gonna blank further there before we'll start drawing video. And then we'll subtract 64 on the other side to bring in and shut video off, you know, 64 before the actual H blank area. So that is 719. Okay, so same thing for the V video area. 480 is our uh, ostensible full video area, but we are only doing 256 rows inside of there. So we have 224 to deal with. So divide that up by two. That means we have 112 on either side. So same story, 147 is gonna be our number where we actually start generating video. And it looks like 402, if my math is correct. It's now that I realize that I'm really just actually writing the code for the chip here. Um, so that's fun. Like I said, I was gonna write fakey code in here, uh, but uh, I guess I'm so close to just writing the actual code here that uh, it looks like we'll at least have a buggy version of the real thing. So obviously we've got the video address that's being generated. Uh, VCE, no. Um, video mux, obviously no. The bus chip enable, output enable, read write, these ones we're still gonna have to fake, for sure, because we don't know what our bus is like yet. Um, we have VSync and Async handled. Usually for my fakie, I'll just take some inputs that I don't have figured out yet, like these guys, and tie them in some way to some outputs that I don't know what they are. So yeah, a lot of small signals we still need to figure out. Let's start by figuring out our video muck signals and actually our video chip enable, which right now I'm realizing, why, why didn't you stop me when I was writing this? This really should be like VCEA and VCEB because we want, uh, we have one chip enable for each chip. Um, and that'll really be driven by one signal and then inverted, but we do need two signals. So let me patch that up really quick. Okay, I think that's all the spots. So let's write down these signals. VCE, well, these ones are easy because we know that VCE, let's make VCE B equal to the negation of VCE A at all times. But then what is VCE A? So we need to swap chips once every four pixels, right? So let's use VA because that will, that, that will always properly map. So this is going to be VA2. Hopefully that, that makes sense to my brain. So God knows if it makes sense out of my skull. Um, the video muck signals should be pretty straightforward because that's actually just going to be those first two bits, right? Because it's going to be uh, first pixel, second pixel, third pixel, fourth pixel, which corresponds to each of the four mux pins. So video mux. Firstly, it should be completely off. Actually, we have to remember these are inverted too because this is the output enable of those chips that we're using. So probably easiest just to invert this whole thing. If we are blanking, then they should just be off. In this case, and this is the important thing, you know, you can optimize this out, but this is the actual place where something would happen when we're not blank. And what we're doing there is selecting uh, one of the four condition, and one of the four pins based on what our video address is. And basically we're just writing a truth table here. So if these are both zero, one, if this is one and that's zero, two, if this is zero and that's one, or three, if they are both true. So there are, I'm sure, way better ways of writing decoders, but there you go. That's most of our video output stuff because uh, video mux basically corresponds to, since this chip isn't handling the actual video output, this is analogous in our old code to this video signal, which was actually going to the video header. Okay, so finally let's wire up some fakey stuff to the rest of the signals. So basically all of these that we are not using for anything. So uh, we know that busy out, we're not tying to anything yet. So right now let's just make busy O equal the sum of all of those inputs. Okay, so that covers busy out, busy I, our CPU address pins, the uh, CPU read write signal, and whatever our CPU access signal is going to be. So we just need to do something with these guys. Uh, the bus chip enable, bus output enable, and bus read write. Um, so those I'm just going to tie all high for now um, because we're not accessing the chip on that side at all. Later, those will interact with the CPU bus signals to uh, access the chip until it needs to be written to or read from. Okay, I'm sure I missed some stuff, but that is the crux of it. 
So I'm going to go back here and I am going to try and build this guy and see what it does. Fingers crossed. Well, dang. The compile the compilation is always really pretty fast. Um, it's the routing that takes forever. And it, it said it did it. Okay. Processing complete. Zero errors. Zero warnings. Um, that makes me feel uneasy, but I'll take it. Okay, I guess that means our code is good. The next step is to fit the design. And that means taking whatever the logic description that's in the file we just compiled is and actually try and route it into the chip we're using. Oh boy. That's not good. So I expected it to blow up somewhere. And here is where it is. Boy, it looks like there are a bunch of address counts still in here. Okay, well, I'm going to start doing some cleaning up here. <laughs> There's your problem. You're probably yelling at me. Okay, that took care of a lot of it. 102, looks like I probably don't have enough parentheses. Or too many. Have you been wondering this whole time while you've been watching this what the hell these are? They're, they're or. This is how you write or enable. That's kind of non-intuitive. I've seen it used other places, too, but... Yeah, a little odd. Okay, this should be the one. Ooh... Nice. And that's the end of the video. Um, yeah, my apologies. I'm going to have to cut this one in half because this is just a bear of a video. I kind of didn't have a plan when I started it. As you can tell, I never have a plan. That's kind of the point, is just to kind of journal my work without thinking too hard about it. But uh, this one, whew, I mean, you just watched 20 minutes of able coding and a lot of it very uh, shoddily done and confusing at that. So um, I can't imagine that this has been super exciting for you, but thanks for watching. Um, I'm splitting this one up. Uh, I did film everything up to the point of actually getting back to the board, doing the programming and all of that good stuff so that we can actually test some of our uh, timing generation. But I'm going to save that for next time because this is already like a 30 something minute video. <laughs> so um, next week, I'll let you know, or at least next video I do. I don't know. You know, it's been what, like a month and a half since the last one I put up. Um, but I'm going to switch back a little bit to another thing that I already shot, which is more stuff on the Vax video card. Um, that one has a pretty fun resolution. And I've been waiting to get that one up, actually, because that's a more uh, maybe entertaining project. So that's the next thing that'll come around, and then we'll get back to this thing, um, which is promising, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a handful. So thanks for watching. Thanks for spending some time with me as always. Good to have some uh, buds around to roll their eyes at my work. Um, but, you know, I appreciate having you by. So until next time, bye. Thank <laughs> you.